Hi, I'm Nicole Johnson, and I'm the Research Director of the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association. I'm presenting to you today the results of two surveys we've done in 2020, and the title of my presentation is Ontario Higher Education in 2020, Lessons from the Pivot to Online Learning. So before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the land that I'm on. I'm presenting to you today from the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the, it's the shared ter territory of the Sumas First Nation and the Matsqui First Nation. These two First Nations are part of the Stolo First Nation and the Stolo people have lived in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia for 10,000 years. And it is for this reason that I acknowledge the traditional territory on which I reside. I'd also like to acknowledge the people and partners who made this research possible. I would like to thank eCampus Ontario. I would like to thank Bayview Analytics, Academica Group, and Contact North. And I'd also like to acknowledge our research team, which consisted of myself, Dr. Jeff Seaman, who's director at Bayview Analytics, and Dr. George Valencianos, who's professor and Canada research chair in Innovative Learning and Technology at Royal Roads University. So the background to this research study, in 2020, the CDLRA implemented the Canadian Pulse Project to track the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on higher education institutions across Canada. In previous years, we've done a national survey. This year was different, and this year created the opportunity through COVID-19 for us to take a different approach. And what we did is we did two surveys as part of our Pulse project. The first stage was conducted in spring of 2020. We launched the survey on April 24th and ran it through May 1st, 2020, and we reached respondents uh, through an email outreach in Academica Top 10. For the first stage in the spring, we had 261 respondents, with 115 of those respondents being from Ontario. And the bulk of the respondents were either faculty or administrators, with a fairly even split between the two. And then we also had several other um, respondents who uh, had marked themselves as other being that they weren't faculty or administrators, but they still worked within higher ed. The second stage of the study took place in fall of 2020. We opened the survey on August 10th, and we ran it until September 22nd, 2020, um, with the caveat that the bulk of our uh, responses came in September. Uh, very few responses came in in the month of August, just due to people being off for the summer. Uh, the fall 2020 outreach, uh, we also had people recruited respondents from the Academica Top 10. Contact North included a link to our survey in their newsletter. And we also uh, did an outreach to the CDLRA roster, which we typically use to reach institutions for our national survey. As a result, for the stage two of our research, we had 427 respondents, with 194 being from Ontario. So in this presentation, I'm going to discuss the combined results of these two surveys specific to Ontario. I'm going to start by talking about the challenges that arose in 2020, most of which we're familiar with, being that it, COVID-19 has affected us all tremendously. The professional development that faculty said they needed or would like, uh, professional development that was offered to them, and also the impact then on faculty preparedness for the fall. I'll discuss as well considerations as we go forward as online learning is continuing to persist and will likely well into the winter semester and likely well into 2021. And then as well, feelings of optimism and pessimism about the future of higher ed, both amongst uh, faculty and administrators. And then finally, several post-pandemic implications. So the challenges of 2020, uh, we, we all, especially if we work in higher ed, are very familiar with. Immediately following the rapid transition to online, there was a lot of concern among faculty administrators on the best ways to help students transition 
to online and the best way to adapt courses, uh, to adapt assessment techniques, and also to support students uh, just in their own mental health and well-being as they coped with the transition on their end. There were concerns about the quality of online learning. We know that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, many faculty had very little experience in online teaching and learning. There were concerns as well related to the impact of COVID-19 on their institution, and that's amongst faculty and administrators alike. Of course, one of the biggest concerns we, we heard was the impact on international students and what that was going to mean for institutions going forward. And of course, there was concerns about ongoing uncertainties, which still persist. We don't know how long we'll be in this pandemic state. And right now, we are in a state where online learning is our norm for the foreseeable future. So as we talk about professional development and faculty preparedness, I'm going to talk about a couple of the questions we asked in the spring, particularly related to PRODI topics and uh, preferred methods for PRODI, and then also in the fall, the PRODI opportunities that were available um, prior to fall, so typically opportunities that faculty pursued over the summer, and then the effectiveness of those professional development opportunities, and finally, faculty preparedness for fall. So in the spring, we asked faculty what types of topics they wanted to receive professional development on. What did they need to know to support their students? The response we got from our Ontario respondents were assessment strategies for teaching online was the top, closely followed by pedagogical strategies. And then the third most was strategies for supporting students in learning online. What we can see from the slideshow is that um, the chart shows us that the bulk of the topics that faculty suggested they needed to know were related to supporting students. At the bottom, we see, you know, how to work effectively from home and um, best strategies to access online course materials. But typically, the major concern was how to best support students. We also asked what faculty would prefer in terms of the type of PRODI or the nature of PRODI that they received. So their desired professional development methods, um, the top response was an online resource hub with links to different trainings. And we saw that 75% of respondents selected this option. There were also um, amongst Ontario faculty, a standalone asynchronous online session on a topic of interest. So that would be something similar to a webinar and as well um, asynchronous online sessions as part of an ongoing series. They were all either around 50% or more, um, uh, but we have standalone synchronous online session at 52% and then synchronous online sessions as a part of an ongoing series at 49%. When we got to the fall and we did our fall survey in late August, early September, we asked faculty what types of professional development were either provided or recommended by their institution? And the top response by far was live or recorded webinars, with 93% of respondents saying that they had the opportunity available to them to take live or recorded webinars. The next at 66% was training um, for an online resource hub. And similarly, there was faculty mentoring offered at 61%, online faculty community at 58%, self-paced training at uh, 57%. For obvious reasons, there was uh, only about a quarter of respondents indicated that in-person training was available to them. What was interesting is regardless of the type of professional development that was offered, the faculty responded that it was highly effective. So we see that 98% of faculty felt 
the online resource hub was effective, 97% felt that self-paced training was effective, 95% felt that faculty mentoring was, 92% felt that their online faculty community was effective, and 91% live and recorded webinars. So we see that um, any professional development was effective professional development for faculty, which is an important implication going forward in the sense that, you know, institutions don't need to be able to provide only one type of professional development. Whatever they have available to offer within their institutional resources is likely to be effective for faculty. We also asked faculty then in the fall how prepared they were feeling for the fall. And the one caveat to this response is that faculty were still very early on in the semester when we asked this question. And one thing that would be useful to research going forward is to survey faculty, you know, near the end of the fall semester or early on in the winter semester and ask them again about their levels of preparedness. What we do see is that a strong majority of the faculty agree to some extent that they feel prepared to teach online in the fall. We have about 76% of faculty agreeing to some extent that they are prepared to teach in the fall, with only 13% of faculty saying they disagree to some extent. When we asked administrators whether the faculty at their institution were prepared to teach online this fall, we saw that all, 100% of the administrators who responded to our survey noted that their faculty were prepared to some extent to teach online this fall. So as we go forward, I'm gonna talk about some of the results we found in both the spring and fall that give us a sense of the considerations to keep in mind as we proceed with online learning and as we go forward through the pandemic. So in the spring, we asked about the types of online teaching strategies that were supported by institutions. And we also asked about institutional partnerships. In the fall, we asked about equity, and we also asked about student communications. So in the spring, we asked about the types of teaching tools that were available for faculty when they were teaching online. We saw that institutions either provided or supported online discussion boards, uh, 91% of them did. 85% of institutions provided online polling or quizzes. 79% um, had the ability to have students give speeches or presentations online. 75% were able to have students complete interaction exercises online. 73% were able to facilitate a small group asynchronous exercises. And 73% were as well to able to facilitate small group synchronous exercises online, and 64% were able to have students complete lab activities online. And then finally, we saw about half, 52% of institutions able to provide formal tutoring or peer-to-peer -peer learning in an online learning context. So going forward, this tells us that we need to continue looking at what options are available. And as we go forward in the pandemic, it would be useful to research further to see how this has expanded. If the scope of opportunities um, and abilities to offer different teaching techniques, um, whether that this has expanded in scope as online learning has become the status quo for the foreseeable future, or whether this is relatively the same and relatively steady over time. What would also be useful is to look at how these, um, how these different tools are being used and the types of pedagogical strategies being employed in these different areas. 
We also asked institutions about the value of partnerships in preparing for fall. And we saw a strong response in the spring that institutions were very interested, and this was administrators responding to this question, in partnering in some different ways. And a lot of it was a way to maximize their resources or to share resources and to support one another. We saw that 77% of administrators saw the value of partnering with technology and service providers. 72% saw the value of partnering with other institutions in their province. 70% indicated value of partnerships with national academic organizations. 51% saw the value of partnering with other institutions in a different province. And 28% saw the value in partnering with online program management companies. So again, going forward, it would be interesting to track whether this is changing over time and to track how many institutions have taken advantage of such partnerships or have collaborated with other institutions and to investigate this further going forward and also to investigate the impact of this and how it's impacting faculty, how it's impacting students and whether it's, if it's being employed, if it's being viewed as effective, and in what ways could it evolve or change over time to be even more valuable to institutions. In the fall, we asked about concerns about the capability of institutions to deliver equitable learning opportunities online. So we saw that roughly that about half of respondents indicated that they were either very concerned or somewhat concerned about the capability of their institution to deliver equitable learning opportunities online. And so specifically, this considers students with disabilities and, you know, the adaptations that would have been made in an in-person classroom and how this can be transferred and translated into an online setting. Um, so as we go forward, there is a need to investigate in what strategies are being used by institutions to ensure equity in teaching. Um, where are institutions and faculty members finding challenges in this area? And what are recommendations and strategies for improving equity in teaching online? Because in the spring, we noted that students, supporting students was critical to faculty, that faculty were very interested in knowing how to best support their students and be there for their students and help their students succeed in an online environment. We asked in the fall how they were planning to communicate with students outside of class sessions. And overwhelmingly, faculty reported that they were planning to communicate via email. So of the Ontario faculty respondents, 94% indicated that they plan to communicate with students outside of class via email. 65% indicated that they would communicate via a conference system in their LMS. 52% indicated that they would be doing small group video conferences. And 51% indicated one-to-one -one video conferences. We had about 20% or 19%, sorry, that indicated phone calls. 10% said that they were text. And one of the lowest was social media at 5%. So as we go forward, we had some very interesting open-ended comments as well added to our survey. And what there was is overwhelmingly a tone of... You know, how can we use this moment to change what we do, to do better going forward? How can we shift priorities? And what can we learn from this rapid shift to online and the current state of needing to stick with online for quite some time to improve higher ed going forward? So we had one faculty member who said, this can be a moment to take stock of our role in society as we are forced to consider and prioritize what our academic and pedagogical goals are 
as well as how to achieve them in this ever-shifting situation. And in the fall, another faculty member wrote, I believe the shift to online learning will benefit higher education through improving access to some students. It is an opportunity to look at the courses we teach and determine the fit with online learning in the future. With the increased pressure for classrooms, online learning can help to free up space for courses that are best taught in person. So we see in this a sense of reimagining and reflecting on what higher ed has been and what we can learn from this pandemic situation to improve higher ed going forward. So finally, I want to reflect a bit on the optimism and pessimism that we saw. In each of our surveys, we asked faculty and administrators to, to give their perceptions about whether they were optimistic or pessimistic about the future. So in the spring, we asked respondents to tell us whether they were optimistic or pessimistic about the overall future of higher education over the next two years. So we gave that two year time limit. And we saw that faculty, we had about 47% of faculty that were optimistic to some extent. We had about 38% of faculty that were pessimistic to some extent. And we had about 14% that were neutral. I'm sorry, I think I said faculty there. That was in the spring, this was all respondents, faculty and administrators alike. In the fall, we had a much more optimistic tone. Now, in the fall, we just asked about the overall future of higher education. We didn't put the two-year mark in there. Um, but we saw that much more of our respondents were optimistic, with 69% indicating that they were optimistic to some extent. We had uh, only 15% compared to the 38% in the spring that said that they were pessimistic. And in the fall survey, we also asked faculty, we asked the question broken down a little bit further. So we asked them about their optimism or pessimism about the overall future of higher education, but we also asked them about whether they were optimistic or pessimistic regarding the, um, the future of their institution that we were at and Ontario respondents, um, their responses were identical to the overall future of higher education. Um, so again, for their institution, um, they were 69% were in, optimistic about the future of their institution and 15% um, were pessimistic and 16% were neutral. And then we also saw the exact same numbers when we asked respondents about whether they were optimistic or pessimistic about their future, their personal future in higher education. So again, in the fall, we saw much higher levels of optimism towards the future of higher education than we did in the spring. So going forward with uh, post-pandemic implications. So I'll start by reading two quotes that stood out from our respondents um, in terms of what this all means as we launch into the fall, as we consider where we need to research going forward. But one responded to the spring, and this respondent was uh, neither faculty nor administrator. They were an other respondent, which is why they aren't listed as faculty or administrator here. They wrote, the current situation may force positive structural changes in the educational environment. These changes will result in educational programs that better meet the learning needs of students and create inclusiveness for a more diverse group of students. At the same time, over the next two years, the informal learning that comes from being immersed in a campus community will be significantly diminished. And in the fall, we had a faculty member write, this experience has taught me that remote learning is a viable option. Whereas six months ago, I would have fought it tooth and nail. While the majority of the courses in our program would be better taught and learned in a traditional setting, I now see the benefits and flexibility of having some of our programs being taught online for the long term. So what's interesting here is we are starting to see a shift in attitudes and we're seeing a sense of um, 
how this potentially offers change. So I would suggest the implications of this is that there is a need for long-term research. There's a need to investigate how the pandemic is going to change and shape higher education on the long term. One of the things that we'll be doing at the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association is we will be tracking um, the long-term impact in terms of online enrollments and how this has changed over time. We know that prior to 2020, online enrollments, there were certain patterns, things were a certain way. What we want to see is what happens after 2020 and as we go forward over the next five years, 10 years, do we see a continued increase in online learning, particularly once in-person learning is possible again on a widespread scale? As mentioned before, it's also useful to investigate uh, partnerships either among institutions, between institutions and external organizations, and how people are working together to create excellent educational opportunities at a time when the majority of education needs to be delivered in an online or remote format. We also would like to recommend that further research goes into uh, pedagogical strategies that are being employed and the efficacy of that. Being that we have so many people learning online right now, this is a wonderful time to take a look at what works well and what would be best practices going forward for teaching in an online environment. And then lastly, it would be interesting to track optimism and pessimism over time and how that shifts and changes as the pandemic situation changes and as other events in our global world shift and change as well. And as faculty, more faculty have experience with teaching and learning online, what do we see in terms of perceptions of online learning and the quality of online learning going forward? So with that, I want to thank you for listening to our presentation today. The CDLRA welcomes your insights and feedback. I invite you to email me anytime with questions, comments, feedback you might have. My email is listed up there as well. The CDLRA also has a list of our publications from 2017 through 2020 on our website. And the web address is listed there, cdlra-acrfl.ca um, slash publications. And we invite you to download and read our publications. And again, if there's something that you would like more information on that I spoke about today, I invite you to email me anytime. Thank you very much.